Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Talking with Teal. I'm Ryan Nakate and today I'm here with Jeremy Johnson. So Jeremy, welcome man. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me on the show. It's an honor. Well, I'm honored to be uh, interviewing you. I, I just bought your book. It came to my, at my house uh, yesterday about five. I started reading it about 7.30 last night and I highly recommend it to everyone. I finished it about 10 o'clock <laughs> and I just read it in one sitting. It was that uh, engaging. So I'm, I'm super excited to talk about that today and, and hear all about this. But first of all, can you just share a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in integral theory and also the work of Gebser? Hey, first of all, let me just say, you're a fast reader, man. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so um, it, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but, you know, uh, in high school, I was very interested in, I went to a Catholic high school, so naturally, I was very interested in Eastern philosophy and, and, and things that weren't within the, the framework of Catholicism. So I was reading um, about Buddhism and Taoism and practicing martial arts, and that was sort of my inroads to different forms of thinking. Um, and I think I found Wilbur, gosh, let's see, like right around when I was beginning college. And, and that was right before, um, I forget which Wilbur phase it was, but it was when he was just coming out with integral spirituality. And so I kind of like reverse read everything and just sort of followed it all the way back to spectrum. Um, and at the same time, I was kind of getting involved with uh, Reality Sandwich and the sort of the consciousness culture. Um, Daniel Pinchbeck had come out with a number of books um, kind of riffing on similar topics, right? Like consciousness studies, psychedelics, um, you know, indigenous practices. And, and he was bringing in Gepser and a little bit of Wilbur and a few of these other consciousness studies scholars um, all kind of in there. So it, it was kind of in that context that I discovered Wilbur and Gepser. Um, and basically, after reading through most of, of Wilbur's work and wanting to get a sense of his sources and his inspirations, I started to read Gebser and Tehard and Aurobindo and, and, and the, the, the individuals and the foundations of the sort of the integral milieu that I talk about in the book. So um, that's sort of it, you know, like uh, in, in a very, very succinct uh, statement, I kind of just wanted to read who Wilbur was who Wilbur was reading and drawing his sources from. Um, so that got me on a, on a track with, with Gebser. But as I always describe, um, you know, it was a kind of a, an experiential moment where I had um, gotten Gebser's book. You know, it's a massive, the only book in English is, is this giant text, right? Ever present origin. Mm. Um, and uh, I had taken it out of the library, a big hardcover edition. And I was reading it on the train into Manhattan and just, the very first page as he's talking about time and presence, I, I, I realized that, okay, whatever Gebser is doing with his expression of integral, there's something really unique to it. And I guess I haven't really been able to turn away from it since that moment of just sort of the, aha, there's something going on here about time that I, that's really clicked. Um, and so for the past 10 years or so, I've just found myself reading Gebser, uh, getting involved in Gebserian scholarship, getting involved in the Gebser Society and helping to run the conferences. I found myself becoming the president of the Gebser Society and writing this book. It, it's sort of fallen on my lap in, in a certain way. But um, yeah, so that's sort of a, the, the, the rundown of it. That's awesome. And I applaud you for you know, first reading Wilbur and then looking yourself into some of these original sources, you know, the, the Tehards and the Gebsers and the Aurobindos and then kind of doing that research yourself. And I'm curious about Gebser, was it the kind of the phenomenological description of the stages of consciousness that kind of sucked you in? Because because that to me is something I never I wasn't familiar with at all until hearing about you and reading your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's um that's pretty much the 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 big drawing point for me. It was um it just again you know on the very first pages the way he was articulating how integral was this phenomenological experience, and then. Mm -hmm. Um, as you mentioned, the kind of very detailed, articulate, descriptive um, uh, opening up of the structures and how, you know, he will always have something tangible for you to encounter the structure. And there's something about his style where he's kind of weaving the whole picture as he's going into details. Like he'll be like, oh, we're going to talk about the magical structure. 
but I'm also going to comment on its relationship to the mythical and the mental and then the integral whole, just to kind of um, uh, uh, leave it in a context. So he's always kind of weaving everything together. And I think it, cre it creates, and this is what I've been talking about with uh, some of my students in the Gebser class we're doing right now, reading through the book. Um, there's a kind of a texture or a tapestry to his style of writing that's really immersive and really experiential. Um, and he's always trying to point out in the reader, I think, there these experiences, like, okay, the magical and the mythical shouldn't be abstract. This is not just a category. This is not just something in the distant past. Um, in some ways, it's latent in us presently. And so that's where the phenomenological question comes in. So how do I encounter this? How, how can I encounter this as a form of being in the world, right? And it always has to do with the relationship with time and space. So... Yes, yes, it's, it's kind of, um, it draws you in. It draws you in in a very kind of deep and profound way. And I think aesthetic um, and art and even etymology, he's always finding some way to help you encounter a particular structure or a dimensioning of reality. So um, his method is really good. I think it's really good. And one of the reasons why um, I've been engaging with the integral theory community more more lately than not is to try to convey uh, Gebster's approach to the structures as a very grounding experiential way to integrate them rather than kind of leave them abstractly on the map as, as, as is the kind of tendency in the integral theory community as that recent uh, Jamie Wheel video from uh, uh, Rebel Wisdom was just talking mm -hmm. about. So, so it really is trying to get out from under the, the the bird's eye view and move you back in uh, without getting lost in the whole thing too. So beautiful. Yeah, that's so, I think that's so highly needed because it seems like Gebser really transmits to you kind of the lived experience or first person phenomenological life world of the stage from and, and how that's experienced from the inside rather than a third person kind of abstract uh, what's the word, kind of uh, anthropological, historical analysis, you know, people at purple act like this, people at red are like this, but you really, he really kind of brings that to life subjectively, so you can really feel it. Um, I'm curious about what are some of the main differences? I mean, certainly this is part of, part of it, but what are some of the main differences? I know Gibster has his five stages, right? The archaic, magic, mythic, rational, and mm -hmm. mental, and uh, integral. And so what are some of the main differences between his system, his uh, outline of these structures of consciousness and other modes like spiral dynamics or Wilbur's altitudes? Mm -hmm. So the fundamental difference is, um, and it's a re really profound one, it's that Gebser's structures are not developmental and mm -hmm. he's always mentioning this. It, there is some form of unfolding and you could even kind of describe it. And there is some form of development and emergence that's going on in his approach, but he's so critical of developmentalism and sort of the, the, the ascending to higher and higher and higher stages. Those spatial metaphors for him are, are a form of mental thinking, which he's fine with as a form of mental thinking, but he's actually trying to point out that the models and the systems that we're trying to use to describe the emergence of consciousness, he calls it the phenomenology of awakening, um, need to reflect an integral expression unless we want to get caught up again and entangled again in the kind of the current structure. So the structures themselves are unfolding in dimensionality, but each structure is almost like a kind of crystallized plateau of a life world, right? That kind of flowers into being, but then it kind of gives rise to another one. And they're close in proximity to each other, but they're kind of discontinuous and nonlinear. They're kind of a kind of a punctuated equilibrium. And even though there's a, you can see a kind of a, um, a morphology of the structures, right? Like the kind of unfolding where, um, you know, the, the, the magic is, is uh, one dimensional, the mythic is two, the, the mental is three dimensional spatial. So you can kind of see that as, and you can kind of trace it in the linear way. But then at the same time, they don't really fo neatly fold into each other, right? So the, the mythical world and the mental world are kind of apart in some ways. And the mental world um, is not very good at integrating any of the previous structures. It's, mm. it's sort of a, and he describes the process interestingly, um, as as a kind of remoteness from origin. There's a kind of a distantiation 
of uh, phenomenology from these spiritual presences. And he gives a lot of respect to the magic and mythic in terms of like how they learn to master the world and their forms of maybe not what we would consider mental knowledge, but their forms of being in the world were these kind of masterful um, uh, uh, crystallizations uh, from origin, uh, these masterful mutations. So um, the mental sort of bias in terms of feeling that it's higher or awake and b behind us is superstition, he completely disregards that. And part of that reason, though, is the context that he was writing, right? Like he was in, he lived through both world wars. He uh, was nearly killed by fascists, you know, traveling through Europe. So he he saw the kind of the machinations of um, the underlying ideology of, of of progress and positivism, et cetera. And he kind of saw that how that all played out in Europe. So he was deeply, deeply critical of it. Um, but I think rightly so, because he got out from under just calling it, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, he, he He saw the underlying structure that was happening with those uh, machinations with the whole modernity and the post-war turn and how we kind of revolted against progress. He was even trying to get under that and kind of go like, well, let's try to see the underlying structure of consciousness that is at work and has finally kind of outrun itself and is being destructive and kind of um, self-imploding, right, in terms of the kind of the crisis of the 20th century. So he really wanted to kind of get out from under that. So um, that would be the biggest difference. It's not really developmental. Um, they're kind of discontinuous nonlinear leaps. And his concept of time um, is that each one of these structures has their own expression of time, uh, their own expression of being in the world. So the, the archaic is kind of difficult to speak about as kind of a latency or a zero, but the magic is a sort of timelessness and the mythic is this rhythmicity. And if you think of rhythmicity with, um, astronomical calendrical systems and that kind of really, really complex mastery of understanding these patterns in nature, right? With like Stonehenge and Gobekli Tepe and any of these ancient systems. Those were forms of knowledge that we as moderns have kind of atrophied from, from right? We have a different form of knowledge and, and, and sense of time and space. So I, I think before rambling on for any further, that, that's the biggest difference. The, discontinuous leaps, the moving away from developmentalism, and really kind of calling out the mental structure as, you know, we, we want to keep defaulting back to it. We kind of, we want to keep talking about models of development and progress and, and uh, a spatializing time. And he's saying, no, 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 the, whatever the integral is, we're gonna, it's, it's a discontinuous sort of quantum leap into a new style of thinking and relating. Um, and that's why, as you read in the book, there's the sense that what he was talking about, he was really kind of ironically ahead of his time, like writing about this in the 40s, he would find more kinship, I think, with the styles of writing in, in later postmodern thinking, like Deleuze and Guattari mm -hmm. um, with a thousand plateaus, or um, the kind of emergence in the biological sciences of uh, Stephen Jay Gould and the punctuated equilibrium. So I think he would find a better home in, in those kind of emergent styles of thinking. Um, but again, you know, th th this is why I think he's sort of been underappreciated as a scholar of consciousness, because what a, what a leap, what a discontinuous leap himself to kind of just try to jump in there. Um, and he sets the bar really high, <laughs> speaking of spatial metaphors, because of how critical he is of the mental structure as a sort of spatial, respectable orientation. Um, he really wants us to be aware of it while we're, while we're doing it in order to not get kind of stuck in it again. So. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. So it sounds kind of like how the, the developmental models that a lot of us integralists are so used to in some ways kind of reflect a bias or a predilection to the mental structure. And so he, he in presenting these structures of consciousness discontinuously kind of allows us to separate from the mental and, and to kind of see how we may be, you know, us as modern moderns, right, we're more inclined to naturally put it into some kind of a linear developmental progression and I'm curious about how you know that that diagram of like the, the holons or the the holarchy of like each stage transcends and includes the next one and so his is you're saying kind of different it's it's more like they're they don't like magic or the mythic doesn't unfold the magic and then the archaic right they're kind of like different layers altogether what about the integral consciousness for him does that transcend and include all the previous ones so to speak I would say um no, it doesn't transcend exactly. Um, 
but I think it's the closest we can approximate to that just that metaphor of transcending because still transcending and including is this kind of upward movement and there is no upward movement. I would say for, for Gebser, uh, the integral is sort of an imminental movement. It's a kind of a seeing through everything. Um, it doesn't need to move up or down or below or left or right. There, the spatialness that we're so used to thinking about um, is superseded somehow. And, and our language is, is so spatial that it's it's almost impossible to have a non-spatial language. We, we, we so naturally, you know, even the word in, that, that, that was used in the translation that he uses um, is superseded and that's still kind of getting over something. And it's just, it's not that at the same time. Um, but at the same time, there is a relationship to the idea of transcendent include because I think that the, the, the impulse behind that metaphor is to be more holistic, to kind of get the whole in some way. And I would say, yes, the integral structure is somehow capable of getting the whole. All of the previous structures kind of had their own life world, as we're saying, and their own kind of um, um, habits of being. Uh, but the integral structure is able to kind of wear them. And he uses wear, W-A-R-E, to kind of be aware of these structures and sort of internalize them and integrate them into, into this sort of presence. Um, and that's the difference, I think, with the integral structure. It's not just sort of consciously, mentally retrieving the magic and the mythical according to the mental's terms. It's actually kind of dis defixating ourselves from the mental and then reintegrating the magic and the mythic and these, these previous structures into this whole and sort of an imminental whole. Um, and so it kind of tries to get over the, the spatial metaphor of climbing or, or getting to higher. And instead, it's sort of like presentiating everything that's happening. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to describe. And he, he both uses um, so two important concepts, right? The, the fourth dimension. So um, he's always talking about the fourth dimension and time as being integral to integral consciousness. And it's this idea that um, temporix as we've understood it in the mental has typically meant a kind of a chronological time, a kind of a, uh, a linear or directed time of past, present, and future. And what Gebser is saying in, in, a, in a sort of mystical way and in an intuitive way is that time is actually a kind of fundamental function of reality and it's not just a linear formulation. It seems to be able to hold the past, present and future together and the sort of he uses another word amensional instead of fourth dimensional mm -hmm. as a sort of um the true nature of time he describes it the quintessence of time is the achronon is time freedom and there's really no again the, the metaphors here escape us and i've had to use a few different examples in the book but um that they're almost kind of psychedelic you know it's, it's almost kind of um he resorts to art. He resorts to sort of, sort of showing Picasso stylism uh, of, of, you know, he, again, he was writing in the, in the 40s. He knew Picasso personally, and he felt that Picasso, in terms of um, an artist, an integral artist, was trying to concretize, meaning trying to sort of embody and realize this new time concept in his art and make it manifest in his art in the same way that Renaissance artists were like trying to manifest space and, and, realistic spatial consciousness that we now, we now know is called perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he was looking for artists who were doing that and scientists who were doing that and somehow kind of getting that time is not just this linear spatial thing, but there's sort of this multi-dimensionality to time um, that, that forms a greater whole. And for him, he thought this is how we, we come online with the integral, is to integrate time and to realize and concretize time. Um, and that's not just clock time. But we're in a kind of a middle period because we are predominantly mental beings and perspectival beings. It's just sort of our center of gravity. It's been for hundreds of years. It's been this kind of coalescing process for the past few thousand years in terms of the, the kind of the coalescing of the ego and the spatial mental individual. So it, this is not an easy task, this transformation. And, and of course, we're kind of dealing with the, the crisis right now, right, with, between late capitalism, climate change, and so on. But we we'll probably get into that, too, as a whole, a whole topic of discussion. But Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's, again, it's really interesting how there. It's a very different <clears throat> model. And in my mind, I'm kind of trying to see what kind of consonants or confluency there are between 
the more linear developmental approaches and, and, and what uh, Gebser is getting into. And I, so I have, what we were talking about a little bit of art and stuff, and I kind of want to jump ahead into a very specific kind of historical question uh, that I've noticed in my studies of intellectual history. And it seems as if in the uh, early 20th century, it was kind of like the age of time, where like time in, in, in European intellectual history was really being redefined and kind of brought to the forefront. So a few examples would be like uh, James Joyce's Usulies and his literary style of writing, right? Uh, obviously Einstein and space time and general relativity, Heidegger as a philosopher, being in time, Henri Bersan, Whitehead, philosophies of time, right? And, and you know, all these artists that you mentioned and how they kind of depicted time differently in their art. It was very different from the realism or um, perspective of uh, some of earlier modern art or Renaissance art and that kind of thing. And it seemed like this, this period lasted a while. And then it kind of like, I don't know what happened to it. And I'm kind of curious, like, how, where does that fit into his, how he maps integral consciousness onto history? Like, was that a mm -hmm. kind of like a surge of integral consciousness and it petered off into postmodernism? Mm -hmm. Or like, what do you make of all of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a great question because in, in some ways we kind of missed what Gebser would have said because he died in 1973 and, and um, he wasn't around for the kind of the postmodern turn in, in terms of culture and, and Andy Warhol and, and this sort of, I don't know, there was so many interesting things that happened in the 70s and 80s and especially the rise of postmodernism in academia, uh, especially in the 80s, right? Um, so in some ways we can kind of see that as, I see it as two different things. Um, first of all, historically, uh, one of the ways he was articulating the sort of emergence of time as a concept, right? Like in the same way that Renaissance and, and, and um, medieval, late medieval humanists were kind of waking up to this new sense of space. And it was kind of happening in all these different fields you know, of scholarship, of art, of um, uh, theology. Um, in the same way, there was a kind of a, a, a quickening or an awakening that you can kind of see in all these different systems and, and expressions of culture. Um, in the 20th century and the 19th century, we had a few waves of that as well. Um, and one of the precursors, and I think this is good too, because um, we have an opportunity in studying the sort of leap from the mental to the integral to really get into details in a way that we can't as much with previous transformations because of the lack of, you know, detail mm -hmm. and historical research and, and availability of those materials. So it's really kind of fun to think about this in terms of our, our own kind of transitional moment, how much resources we have to kind of try to understand it. Um, but one of the concepts he talks about is this, uh, a, a prelude in a way to the realization of time as a sort of amensional reality that's sort of expressed by many of these artists that you're mentioning and thinkers. Um, is what he calls the the concept of time, which is kind of more it's still the mental, right? But it's interesting the way he describes it um, in that it's it's kind of a, almost a I don't know I don't want to exactly call it this because it's it, it's not just this, but um, time emerges as a kind of phenomenological disruptive presence in Western culture, and it begins to emerge very concretely through what he describes as the, you know, the invention of the steam engine by um, James Watt, uh, the rise of the French Revolution, the sort of the sense of history moving somewhere, kind of picking up speed. You know, Jeff Salzman from the Daily Evolver actually describes it very well, the sort of upthrust, you know, the sense of things are moving, but in a way that are out of control. And a lot of modernist thinkers and sort of post-war thinkers has sort of articulated this, this, prop, this ambiguity with modernity that um, the, the project of modernity had kind of unleashed these forces that were not truly understood. And, and a lot of post-war thinkers have kind of called it a, a, a failed attempt. I don't really wanna get into if it's failed or not, but the idea of progress and the movement of history moving forward um, begins to be this kind of phenomenon that we all feel, right? Every decade, there's some kind of technological revolution um, or a social one. And we've been dealing with this kind of, um, what, what you know, Walter Benjamin was trying to describe in his thinking, right, as a sort of, um, he didn't call it a nightmare of history, but in a way, it, it's this sort of catastrophe of things, a sort of the winds from, divine, from heaven kind of blowing forward in that Paul Klee uh, 
fragment that he talks about. Um, Kevin Kelly, a techno theorist, he talks about this as well, and he has a book called Out of Control. So it emerges, time emerges as a force in the same way that uh, space emerged as a force in the late medieval ages, where these new, you know, Copernicus was coming up with this new theory, um, you know, um, medicine was going through a revolution, and Gebser has these descriptions, as you've read, these kind of great kind of summing up where he's like pointing out like look what look in medicine look in science look in theology all of these different people are kind of bursting the unperspectable the mythical structure is kind of just erupting out of that space that world space is sort of falling apart um, we start to see that too in the in the the mental spatial world where time is just sort of rupturing space it, it's sort of rupturing the mental structure and kind of um running it out of control you know it, you want linear time fine we're going to go as fast as possible you know it, it just kind of speeds and ramps everything up so as a phenomenon that we experience uh he describes it as a sort of speeding up of time as a kind of a negative manifestation of time and then also um fragmentation because the mental uh, we haven't really gone through how he describes each of the each of the structures in detail but but one of the the achievements of the mental structure of thinking in general is to kind of cut through myth, is to kind of cut through and, and understand and to pick apart. Um, and that ability of discursiveness, of diuresis, of the, uh, the, the pyramidic form of thinking that he describes that we understand in the dialectic, um, that cutting through of things is wonderful, but then if it's the only thing you're doing and you're doing it immoderately, as a, as a social phenomenon, your culture is going to continuously fragment and fragment and fragment until everyone has their own little specialized knowledge discipline and nobody's able to talk to one another. So in some ways he kind of anticipated what we started to go through in the late 20th century in this sense of cultural fragmentation with postmodernism, this sort of everyone's kind of in a culture war now. And then the internet has been this sort of ambiguous space where it was meant to connect us, but we're still kind of using some of those forms of thinking. And so we're uh, at pers perspectival mental. And so the fragmentation is still happening here. And we've actually found better ways to, to, to make the cut and to perform ratio. So I would say the 20th century is this great example of this sort of Janus faced interim world where the mental and the integral are both kind of pushing and pulling and things are coming online that are really new and exciting, but then the mental's kind of capturing it and, and, and reassessing it and spatializing it. And so that creates a crisis and it, it bursts that, that particular attempt and then breaks through again. So everything we, we're seeing is a sort of organic, dynamic, messy process between the integral and the mental um, as these two kind of centers of gravity, you know? And, and I think that's sort of a good way to, to, to articulate it because you're right, in the early 20th century, we had this beautiful eruption of, of thinkers on time and, and artists and, and there was a sense that maybe it could kind of the integral could come online then um, and it sort of did but in waves um, in very kind of nonlinear organic waves and pulses so your description of it I think is accurate that there are these kind of waves and pulses that kind of crystallize in culture get captured get interpreted by the old and then again sort of get broken open because the integral won't be held down by this perspectival world it wants to kind of break through and presentiate itself so yeah i hope that answered your question yeah 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 excellent excellent um so i guess to put it in quadrant in wilbur's quadrant terms right i think gebser is brilliant in in elucidating the upper left quadrant phenomenological reality of each stage. And I guess this question is more, maybe more like a prediction kind of a thing. <clears throat> you know, you had mentioned that when the mental structure was coming online, of course, there are a lot of lower right quadrant structural and physical changes and things that correlated with the arising of the mental structure, you know, tr uh, trains and, you know, Gutenberg's printing press and all of these other geopolitical events, treaties of Westphalia and, you know, Columbus saying the blue, Copernicus, that kind of thing. Um, what, is, what do you think are some of the structures that will arise in the, in the lower right quadrant that would correlate with the onset of integral consciousness? I'm thinking about, you know, things like iPhones and internet that you had kind of alluded to, you know, things that characterize our 21st century, 2019 time period. But what, are, what do you think are some, um, just some structural features of 
integral consciousness that will really mark that we're, we've really moved into that age and we're now experiencing time fundamentally differently from the mental. Yeah, great question. Um, so this is kind of the subject, I, I, I layer it a little bit in my book as, as a kind of a primer, but this is sort of the subject of the next book, which is really kind of looking at taking Gebser's approach of the integral A perspective and really looking at the present, a kind of a footnote to ever present origin in the sense that I'm taking the methodology and applying it again and, and really thinking about where we are now, you know, 70 or so years after that book was written. Um, but just a few examples, you know, um, already mentioned that kind of intermediate examples, like the, um, you're talking about, uh, the, the, the steam engine and the trains and, and everything else, industrialization, but that, that's sort of an, a, it's not as clear, it's not as a kind of a quintessence of this sort of integral, but um, you mentioned the iPhone and I like the iPhone as an example. I'm actually borrowing this from another great podcaster and Gibsarian influenced uh, scholar, Connor Habib. Um, and he had a great solo podcast episode talking about this idea that, okay, you know, the integral is not no longer about spatialization. It, you don't need to move anywhere to, to go anywhere. You can bring everything out in the present. And he was giving an example. Here's here's my iPhone of um, the, the 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 smartphone as a sort of minor expression of this new a spatial world where the thumb and he uses the example of the astronaut's thumb, right? Where the, an astronaut on the moon during the Apollo missions could hold his thumb up and blot out the Earth with his thumb. And it's this idea that, you know, somehow all of space has been kind of shrunken down into a point. And, you know, one point can be all points, sort of like the magical again. Mm -hmm. um, and so we re recapitulate this in our usage of social media and the internet and digital mm -hmm. electronic spaces because those spaces have superseded the normal spatial reality. You can navigate the entire world with your thumb on your phone, on Google Maps, or communicate to people around the world with your finger on the phone. So there's a sense of standing still now and being able to kind of be telepresent everywhere. And Marshall McLuhan talked about this too. I think, you know, in terms of like uh, another prophetic thinker who, who speaks very much to what you're describing as the lower right, would be McLuhan. And I think McLuhan's discussion of electronic culture is very synonymous with Gebser's discussion of the integral structure of this sort of um, the breaking up of causal thinking and the disrupting of the spatial world uh, into the sort of electronic telepresence and co-presence everywhere all at once. You know, he says, you know, causality and linear time ended with the advent of electronic culture. And this is McLuhan being kind of, you know, um, making a kind of an outrageous statement, but it makes sense that time, uh, that space is superseded now and that we can be co-present everywhere. Um, and that the whole form and the style of thinking that was so present in print culture, which sort of cut things up and required the kind of the daylight waking mind to be awake and to read a text, you know, the light shines on the text. Now with electronic media, the light is shining through again in a kind of an iconographic form. So it's sort of retrieving these older structures, which is part of the phenomenon of the integral too, right? The retrieving of um, the boundaries between the magic and the mythic are gone and they're kind of seeping back up like we saw in the early 20th century. So electronic culture is playing with the magic and the mythic. It's playing with the supersession of space. Um, and Gebster talks about this too in, in Ever Present Origin. He has a few phrases where he's describing it sounds like straight out of a media studies McLuhan book where, um, you know, our, our new technologies are enabling us to supersede distances and boundaries and nations. And so when he's talking about that, he's describing the same kind of co-presence, the sort of networked and decentralized future that a lot of people are trying to articulate right now. A lot of scholars and like Hart and Negri, um, you know, Douglas Rushkoff is talking about this sort of reclaiming the internet's utopian potential um, w w all of these kind of latent hints of this imminental decentralized networked world and these philosophies trying to articulate that through government, legal systems, economic systems that are more decentralized. Those are, I think, the, the lower left and the lower right impulses that are coming online with this new integral structure. And of course, it's difficult and a lot of them are failing and Bitcoin's always having some trouble. But the larger picture 
is that they're all manifestations of this new non-spatial world, which is more about networks, relationship, imminence, um, and the co-presence of different time as a kind of phenomenon. Like electronic music is this great example of a temporal play, you know, sampling bits from different decades and putting them together in pastiche and um, a sort of, uh, Maria Popova describes it as combinatorial creativity. Um, and I love that term. I love that word because for her, like it's a kind of a, let's look back at knowledge and understand that it's always been this way, right? It's, knowledge has always been combinatorial. Let's open up the text as a hypertext. These are all styles of thinking that are very integral, a perspectival that we're, we're seeing everywhere. Um, but the, the challenge I think that, that Gepser leaves us with, um, and McLuhan does too, it, it's this idea that um, we really need to concretize the magical and the mythical and the mental and really understand what they are in us. Mm -hmm. um, and he has this really interesting description that sounds sort of science fiction-y, and I love it because of that. But um, Gepser's describing, you know, in the same way that the mythical world of the soul and of the world soul kind of got retracted into the new mental individual um, and shrunk into the psyche. You know, James Hillman talks about how the world, the soul used to be out in the world and then it kind of withdrew into, into psychology and kind of got rediscovered in, in, within the self, within the unconscious. Um, in the same way that there's this withdrawing of the mythical into the mental, um, could there be a, a withdrawing of the mental into the integral in, the, in terms of, you know, needing to spatialize this integral world in terms of technology? Can we interiorize what technology is mirroring for us out in the world, which is sort of co-presence, simultaneity, et cetera? I don't know if that would mean we wouldn't need technology anymore, but I think he's saying um, we really need to sort of interiorize what we're projecting and retract it. Um, at least at an individual and, and a social level. So I don't know what that looks like, but it's really an exciting idea. And I think it, it hits the mark for like, how, what would an integral person be doing? Well, they, they wouldn't be projecting and surrounding themselves in an unconscious way with all of these sort of technological projections. They'd be able to interiorize the meaning of all that, even if they still need the, the exteriorization of the technology. So, I, you know, in, in Aqual, I think it would be, okay, we've embedded ourselves in a technological environment, which is mirroring, you know, the dislodged magical and mythical structures in terms of, you know, we're surrounding ourselves and enclosing ourselves in this virtual world, which is sort of similar to the mythical and the unperspectival world, but a sort of technologized version. And it's also surrounding us in a kind of a literalized form of what the integral is supposed to be, which is the sort of time wholeness, supersession of space, etc. Um, can we learn the lessons from what we're surrounding ourselves with and internalize them. And that would be the integral. That would be the true kind of crystallization of the integral to kind of bring in and to retract what we've been projecting. But sorry, a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> no, that was awesome. It's funny, every time you, you say anything, I have like 50 million questions just arising, <laughs> you know, in my head. And, and this, is, this is another one that I, I really wanted to get to with you because I have a lot of discussions with integral friends about like what the heck is integral consciousness anyway, whether it's yellow or teal or turquoise or second tier or whatever. And, and we talk a lot about just what that is. And, and if, if someone is integral or a system is considered integral, like what are the boxes you'd have to check in order to qualify it as such? And what you're describing, it, it sounds like there are these aspects of integral consciousness that are already kind of present in society, and, and especially as we move towards more decentralized network-based systems. But my, I guess, maybe bias or understanding of integral consciousness is that there is some intrinsic spirit of like goodness or value in it. Like it is, there is something about it that is inspiring and spiritually uplifting for your soul. And I don't know if that's like, really true in, in a sense because like like I'm thinking about certain artists who maybe who may in Gebser's uh, um, language may have been considered integral and and as they de depicted the transformation of time and so forth but I wouldn't necessarily think of those artists as being like spiritually inspiring you know mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know how to even phrase this question so I guess I guess the question would be something like is integral consciousness in Gebser's understanding of it is that just another stage or is it actually like embedded with some intrinsic spiritual value that other stages do not have? Mm. Or is it more like a neutral development? Um, very difficult question to answer. Um, 
but a good one, a really good one, because, you know, on the one hand, we can see this structural transformation in the same way that we would see any of them in terms of, you know, the mythical structure coming online. And there are plenty of good and bad people. You know, it was a world in which we inhabited and the degree to which an individual could um, uh, uh, attain some kind of spiritual uh, praxis and ethos uh, would be more of the question of like, okay, is this, you know, is there something intrinsically good about the mythical? Well, sure. You know, I mean, in terms of the mythical, there's the polarities of the soul and kind of the mastery of time, time, time and rhythmicity um, and understanding and navigating these kind of um, movements between life and death. There's a lot of wisdom in there, right? Um, so in the integral, I think in the same way, there is for those who can concretize it and realize it. I mean, Gepster's always describing it as the spiritual, right? Mm. He's describing it as synonymous with origin and wholeness. Mm. So there is a kind of a sense that um, it's more than just a new kind of world space, a new phenomenological time space we're moving into that's mm. neutral. There is a kind of a spiritual wholeness orientation towards it. I don't think that will mean that you know, like Picasso, you know, it's kind of an asshole in, in his, in his life. you know, like, I don't think that will mean that everyone who's articulating it is going to be a great bodhisattva or a, mm. a saint. Um, mm. I think that's always a more difficult challenge. You know, I think that's always a more kind of, well, how much can you really internalize it? Um, and, and, and in another sense, this spiritual principle has always been present in all of the structures. Um, maybe it's been the same thing in all of the structures in terms of, you know, wholeness, uh, origin, sort of the, the ori the, you know, Gipser has this unfolding, right? And the structures all come out and, and, and spring up, like literally in German, ursprung from origin. And origin is a spiritual whole. The, the source, in, which sort of, um, I don't want to use emanates because that's sort of too Neoplatonic, but it brings forth these different, world spaces, but it also brings forth what it means to be human. So to be an integral human being is, is to have a wholeness. And I think there's a spiritual health to that. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who can really understand that, then yes, I think there is, um, there is something intrinsically uh, beautiful and spiritual and um, even ethically important about the integral structure. Um, so I would say both are true. You know, it is this neutral world space we're entering into that's affecting everything. But then at a deeper spiritual level, at a more at truly imminental presence that we can kind of open up to, this is a, this is a, a, a spiritual um, uh, uh, concretization. You know, it, it's, it's how do you truly realize origin as the human being? That is a spiritual process. So as a whole, I'd say it's a spiritual process. And as an individual, it can be uh, a deeply spiritual process. Um, Throughout the book, he, he's always giving these little examples for what it would mean to be an integral human being. Mm -hmm. um, and he's always saying, you know, first of all, there's this practice you have to do, which is presence. You always have to be kind of be present in this hyper wakefulness, um, not sort of the mental wakefulness, but the sort of lucidity. Um, and he's always saying, like, always take back your, your projections, very Jungian kind of comment, like in, in this sort of di uh, uh, clear, present, equanimous state um, take back everything you don't project anything onto anybody else and just sort of be open and be present and you'll see you know what where you lie at fault for certain things and so so he has a kind of a spiritual contemplative praxis that's implicit in ever present origin um, and towards the end of the book and in his other writings too he's always talking about how you know the, the fundamentals of Christianity in terms of you know divine love um, and compassion and the opening of the heart. And like, these things are very integral, you know? So it's not just something for the later structures to receive. It's a sort of thing that's always present behind the world and through the world that we can become open to. It's just that now, it's just that now phenomenologically, those, those distances, right? The, the, the kind of unawareness is getting more and more difficult to maintain. Um, somehow we have to be more present than we've ever been before and aware of all these different structures in us than we've ever been before in order to survive the current crisis. Um, so I would say, yes, it is a spiritual process. There is a spirituality um, that's intrinsic to this. Um, that's, that is very significant. Awesome, awesome. So this is another question I wanted to really, it's a very specific question. And 
I watched your interview with Jeff Salzman, which was awesome. And uh, I figured that this conversation kind of build off of that one. And you had briefly mentioned Dogen in that conversation, oh. but you didn't get into it. And I was, that really piqued my interest because I come from a Zen Buddhist family. My mom is a Zen Buddhist minister. And so I grew up with a lot of people who are studying Dogen, reading Shobo Genzo and, and contemplating his concept of Uji or like being time. And, and I'm just curious, you know, it, how much you study of that and where that kind of fits into Gebser's understanding of integral. And because when I studied Dogen, I, my initial, my immediate thought was this guy is kind of an integral thinker back in 12th, you know, 13th century Japan. Um, so I was, I was just curious what your, what your thoughts on his work are. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great. Great question. Um, I mean, I think you, you, you kind of already articulated it, but I, I have, in terms of my own practice, I do have, uh, a very simple Soto Zen practice that I, I picked up from um, in undergrad and have continued throughout my years. But um, I've been very interested in Dogen's writings as well, because like you, I felt that there was some kind of insight that he had that felt very integral. But Uji, uh, right, time being, is a very interesting uh, uh, section of the Shobo Genzo in that um, it's so difficult to explain it. And I've, I've, I've kind of learned this from people who try to write about Dogen, that he's this very enigmatic writer and, mm -hmm. and everyone's trying to interpret what he means by things. So I don't know if my interpretation is any more or less accurate. I don't pretend to be a, a, a Dogen scholar or anything, but um, Uji had a very profound impact on me because of how he was describing time as, as a kind of a being. And he, mm -hmm. and as he's writing this in this, Again, I haven't read the original, uh, I've only read the translations, but as he's sort of playfully working you through what it is to be a time being, it's sort of all of these things in all of these different moments sort of crystallized as this being that is co-present, you know, past, present, and future, that integral, a perspectival stylism, I think is so present in Uji. Um, and that's what I, my talk was uh, at the last Gepser conference. It's a sort mm -hmm. of... Um, uh, collapsing of the near and the far in this sort of present. And um, th this idea, right, that I think in the West, we've interpreted it this way, that what does it mean to be enlightened or to have these kind of peak experiences um, of insight, uh, Satori or Kensho, to whatever minor or greater degree is, okay, well, you're one with everything, right? Okay, there's this sort of non-dualism, this sort of unity consciousness that you attain or experience. Um, and it's usually interpreted as a spatial non-duality, right? Like, oh, you're one with everything. That means you and the mountain are one. But it, Dogen in that, in that chapter is talking about time as well. It's not just you are one with this second and this second and this second. He doesn't have any distinctions, but you know, he's, he's moving beyond the, the boundary of distinction between past, present, and future in that essay. And he's sort of leaping into this non-dual awareness of time itself. And he's not cleaving the... Um, the, yeah, okay, so he's not cleaving what we would understand as, okay, the realm of form and, and being and history and the realm of this sort of timeless unity. They're not a part in that essay. And in most of his writing, he, he wants to kind of confound that, that, uh, that distinction um, in a very profound and fun and enigmatic and head spinning kind of way. But um, to me, that was an expression of this sort of integral insight that, you know, time is is this sort of time time is time freedom mm -hmm. and and here he is sort of poetically expressing that in in uji um so i just like lit up when i when i had read it after reading gepser and going he's talking about the same right, thing right. as i know um so it was really kind of energizing to, to know that about dogen because i love his other writings too and they've been kind of important for me in my own contemplative practice so mm -hmm. yeah thank you for asking that question you're the only person who's asked that question about it. awesome awesome dogen, uji. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we can kind of riff on this here because this is, this is my, of course, I haven't read the original writings, but I've read translations. This is kind of my understanding. I want to hear what you think of it. So I think for what Dogen was trying to get at, though, is, of course, core to Soto Zen is the concept of Zazen and you know, the meditation practice. So it has a practical goal in some sense. And I think what um, Dogen was trying to get at was that the nature of reality, right, is time. And that time, everything is therefore constantly in a state of flux and in a state of becoming, which is quite constant with the Buddhist idea of impermanence and, and everything is constantly changing. So it would be spurious, it would be erroneous to assume that reality is a stable thing, 
And so there, and that's what causes suffering is the mismatch, the gap between our minds thinking reality is solid and stable when in reality it is truly in flux and fugacious and fluid and, um, tra and transient. And, you know, a lot of people I think I get very excited about when they read, um, Dogen, and they have a Western philosophy background to say, oh, Heidegger, Heidegger, you know, this is really similar to like Heidegger. And for me, it, it, there is definitely a similarity in, in the relationship between being ontologically and, and time. But to me, it also, I don't know if you've studied Whitehead much, but to me, it has a very kind of Whiteheadian feel of concrescence of mm -hmm. reality is, is in a process of becoming. And it's not a, it, you know, these occasions of experience. It's not a solid, substantive kind of Aristotelian substance kind of a fixed entity, right? That everything is, is very fluid. And to try to tune into that, that tr the true nature of reality as this fluid time flow is what heals our suffering from that rigidity. And do, do, am I... Mm -hmm. to no, completely making sense. Yes, yes. Uh, I haven't read Whitehead in any... Um, I haven't given him his due time yet, but uh, just from what I've been exposed to, yeah, I, I would say that's a great interpretation of of the essay and what Dogen's trying to do. Um, you know, on the one hand, the flux can be considered, you know, like Heraclitus and what he was talking mm. about um, and the sort of the mythical flux that is, is very characteristic of the mythical structure and kind of understanding the, the kind of the flux in, of the world. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you're right. He was, he's talking about these processes that are process oriented, that are transformation. So it's not just a flux and, and there's a kind of a beauty in that. And he doesn't need to separate from it, right? He, he's sort of just time is, um, I forgot what the, the, the poetic metaphor language that he was using in, in the text, but you know, a thousand mountains and, and th a thousand lotus sutras and Buddhas, and that's time and that's time being. Um, so that kind of, it, there's a kind of freedom in time and by being from this kind of uh, process oriented perspective that, I feel to be very powerful and very similar to what Gebser describes as time freedom. And, and Gebser has similar quotes from, uh, or similar, similar descriptions in uh, Ever Present Origin where he's saying, well, what is time? And he goes, you know, time is rhythmicity, time is the machine, time is timelessness, time is, you know, um, any, anything you can think of is, is a form of time. And yet, it's free from all of those things. There's a sort of spaciousness in a, not in the kind of the mental way, but there's this kind of opening. Um, and Gebser was more familiar with, with Western tradition. So he often related to Rilke and the poetry of Rilke to describe mm -hmm. this kind of inner sky that kind of opens up in the integral to feel this kind of spaciousness that flows through things, uh, but not just things, but through temporal events and understanding that time and the processes and the energies of bodies moving through space and moving in space, that time is the fundamental function of all of that. And time is actually this sort of diaphanous, amensional reality that kind of holds the whole thing. And so you don't need to escape it. I mean, you can escape it if you want, it holds that too, but you can kind of just be where you are and be completely free and through the world. Um, so again, stylistically and just somehow, I, I got that transmission from Dogen and, and Uji as well. Mm, awesome. Yeah, I, I remember um, you talking in, in your book about how the future really becomes kind of like a reality in for Gebser and integral uh, consciousness. And I remember a passage from um, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, where I think Shinri Suzuki was quoting Dogen when he said, time flows from the present to the past or something like that. <laughs> or was it future to the pre future to the past? Present? I think it was present to the past. And, and how the very nature of that kind of changes. Can you talk a little bit about like how the future, like have you heard of um, Theory U by Otto Scharmer? I've heard of it. I don't know much about it though. The, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of like um, some kind of similar to integral and it's a lot of integral people who teach it use Theory U as well. But one of the core essences of Theory U is that you want to lead from the emerging future where the future had its own reality and you want to kind of tune into that and bring that into the present. Mm -hmm. and I was just curious if you could just kind of go off on yeah. Gebser is you know, with this whole concept of the future kind of coming alive. Yeah, I mean, he opens up Ever Present Origin with that, like right away in the first page. He's like, you know, mm. past, present. Just as the past is still present, the future is also present and latent. And um, again, it's this idea that, you know, that it's only in the linear spatial mental conception of a world that 
the future isn't available to us that we we kind of distantiate it and we say no no it's 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 beyond you know it's in tomorrow it's far up ahead um but if you supersede space then time is superseded as well and at least in that kind of linear sense so for him uh there is something about the phenomenology of the present that can access potentialities right that can mm. access um the larger process, the time being that you are, this your your being extends into or through time, and there's a part of you that can access that, and that's what he thinks is anyway. With the integral structure, is beginning to um, have a different form of seeing, a kind of I don't want to exactly call it a visionary state, but you know Picasso's painting and these early uh, 20th century artists and writers were, were certainly trying to describe time as a sort of energy and 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 mind you know sort of mind kind of extends beyond just the now um and so you know william Irwin thompson talks about this too that you know accessing visionary states in the imagination is one way to do that is one way to kind of move into this atemporal space and be able to kind of glean past present and future you know um artists do this all the time there's, there's a reason why artists are really good at kind of so not all artists, but a lot of them have a kind of um, a sense of what's emerging in culture and what's emerging in the world. They kind of crystallize it and they don't necessarily have any kind of conscious agency about it. It kind of just comes through them. Um, so again, this is why Gebser is always looking at the art and the aesthetics to kind of glean what's going on in the evolution of consciousness. But um, time is a kind of... Um, well, it, it, it has a kind of reality and a being to it. So in your presence and your capacity to be present, time can open up. And the future and the latencies, the energies, the directions, the metamorphosis, right? You're already a transformed being, you know, at the end of time in a way, in the end of linear time. That can speak, at, he's saying there is actually this sort of dynamic co-informing that reality is this whole and that the future is helping to shape the past. And it's not kind of like a time travel, let's go and change the past. He's actually saying from the beginning, you know, in terms of linear time, the past, present, and future are all kind of co-informing each other in this vastly more difficult to comprehend process of emergence and complexity. Um, and Tehard had a kind of a teleological view of this, but he still kind of gets, you know, it's, it's kind of mental, but Gebser still liked what he was doing because Tehard was talking about this idea that, you know, the Omega mm -hmm. is this sort of future oriented point that is drawing us to it. And I wouldn't say that Gebser's talking about the same thing exactly, but this idea that the future informs, organizes and orients the past and is in constant communication, like a kind of complex organism, right? This sort of multi-dimensional organism that's sort of shaping itself outside of time and space and in time and space it gets into this like kind of a psychedelic you know like it's almost difficult to to even try to articulate this but um we see it in mythology we see it in well contemporary mythology with like 2001 a space odyssey or contemporary movies like interstellar um it's, it comes up a lot the whole idea that you know the future is us you know and the alien is us and it's kind of reaching back um Arrival is another movie that kind of plays mm -hmm. with that idea. So, you know, I think it's sort of, it's cropping up in culture and yeah, it's, it's sort of bordering on science fiction, but um, at, at, a, at a kind of a, um, a tangible sense, uh, I think what helped Gebser get this, he had this like 19, early 1930s flash of insight uh, where he had this experience that time is this whole, the sort of complex intelligent whole um, is, a sense of the past as well. And uh, so for his friendship with Lorca, who is this poet, a Spanish poet, very famous, um, through Lorca's poetry, because uh, Gebser is very interested in poetry, and for him, I think it was a kind of a spiritual path in his youth, um, Lorca helped him open up the past so that the dead somehow were present for him in a kind of an intuitive space. The ancestors were present for him. Um, and, but not, not only that, a struck, the magical and the mythical structures kind of came alive and kind of seeped up from the underground of the mental, you know, the secular spatial world. And we're speaking to him as like, well, there's another reality that we used to inhabit. And somehow I'm able to encounter it as a living reality in the present through this artist. Um, it's the same kind of thing, I think, for us when we're considering the future. Perhaps, you know, 
uh, it's this idea that not only are the dead present, but so are our descendants in some truly not just a metaphoric way, a kind of a truly spiritual poetic way in the present that like the dead and the unborn are there, are here. And yes, this gets into mystical stuff, right? <laughs> but um, primarily it's, it's an act of presence. And to the degree that we can tune into that, I think we can sort of concretize the integral structure in a much more spiritual way that we were talking about. Um, Le Guin has this, phrase um i use it in my book you know who are further who are furthest away from us the dead or the unborn you know who, what how do we measure the immeasurable distances between the past and and the future um the integral its claim is that those distances are are, are getting pulled away and that's a kind of a terrifying idea right diaphany it can be a spooky concept that the past and the future distances are being pulled away and they're all present now so how do we live in a world that's sort of outside of linear time where everything's all at once? That's our, that's our challenge. That's our question. And, and the most profound way and a phenomenological way we're seeing it in the world right now with climate change and everything else where, you know, the results of our actions in time are getting thrown right back at us in a very immediate way. Um, so we have to think of time more simultaneously in general to survive it in in time and space as a biological species that has, you know, a few decades of incarnation, right? Um, so anyway, I'm kind of rambling now, but, but that's sort of the idea. Simultaneity in the integral structure is, is not just a metaphor. It's this sort of concrete phenomenology that we can explore. And it has radical implications as far as climate change and then has intimate implications as far as our own spirituality. I'm really glad you mentioned the movie Arrival because that's all I was thinking about when you were going off, you know, that, that sense of time and being different and everything. Um, I wanted to backtrack for a second and kind of shift gears and ask another question, burning question on my mind, a uh, historical intellectual history question about kind of the onset of postmodernism and post-structuralist philosophy, uh, you know, and in the late 50s and 60s, you know, Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze and Baudrillard and Lyotard and mm -hmm. Julia Kristeva and all these people were kind of becoming prominent intellectuals and taking up a lot of uh, air in the intellectual space, right? And I'm, I'm kind of curious how this postmodern revolution fits into Gebser's, um, you know, rational and integral transition kind of maybe even off of the backs we talked about about the early 20th century there was a lot of work on time and i guess philosophically that was dominated by like phenomenology and existentialism like satra and heidegger and and then we kind of shifted into this more socially oriented postmodern world space i'm kind of curious how that, how that fits into everything yeah yeah um yeah this is this is a hot topic right <laughs> especially right yeah. now in culture because right. it everything going on with the intellectual dark web and, and uh, Jordan Peterson and it, it and, and what Wilbur was talking about in the 90s too he was sort of saying something very similar about you know, mean green meme and, and this sort of um, extreme postmodern turn I, I don't know if I would necessarily agree with any of that actually but at the same time I, I've tried to situate and contextualize what the phenomenon of postmodernism is in relation to Gebser um, and I think it, it still is articulating this sort of Janus face place where, you know, again, the, the, the whole fundamental function of perspectivalism and ratio um, is deconstruction. You know, it, it is to make a cut in the mythical membrane of, 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 you know, the participatory world that we lived in and to wake up to the spatial reality and to measure and divide and articulate and debate and create, you know, for the, to, to create a place for the human waking ego to have their own kind of little totality, you know, here's my vantage point, here's my, um, you know, I'm just talking about this phenomenologically, like being in the world, um, it, it, here, here is where I stand, and here is what I see, and here's what I measure, and I have that relationship between the measurable and the subject that's viewing the object, right? So it's that kind of fundamental situatedness that's been playing out for the past few hundred years um it's reached an, an immoderate extreme so that you know the the very spatial ground that we have been trying to understand and master and divide through measurement has become so granular and so um fragmented that that the immoderate form of perspectivalism is this kind of 
hyper spe spe specialization, the sort of hyper fragmentation um, of knowledge and of knowledge domains. And then of course, ultimately the kind of undoing of the perspectival world is that it, it cuts everything up into these little totalities so that there's no more general world to stand on. You know, everybody, you know, there's flat earthers now because they can kind of, they can kind of create a, a, a false wholeness where all the facts kind of make sense within their little worldview, right? To, to, so this kind of dividing up of the reality and of not having a kind of a general standing point anymore where there is no kind of ground, the sort of post-truth world that we've been talking about in, in media these days, um, this is the kind of the, the immoderate expression of the perspectival world, right? It's deconstruction. You know, it moves from articulation and sort of a, a, a solid footing into, you know, the, the modernist project to this kind of immoderate total deconstruction of the world where everything is sort of relative and, and upside down um, as a kind of a social phenomenon. That's how I kind of see what's going on with postmodernism. Mm -hmm. But a lot of postmodernists themselves, themselves, you know, they haven't really articulated themselves as a different stage exactly. They've just kind of turned the, the cutting uh, ratio back against their own modernity project. You know, they've kind of turned inward and then I guess you can kind of see that as it's eating itself, right? Mm -hmm. But um, they've all admitted, you know, very, very frequently that it's not that there is no kind of solid footing. It's just that there's this kind of, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to make any universal claim because knowledge is so constructive. And I think that's a fundamental insight that finally kind of brings, actually, that kind of finally brings self-insight into the, into the, um, perspectival project. And I think it's the last insight of the perspectival project, right? To kind of finally get the constructedness of this false totality. Gepser has this thing where like he's describing totals, right? And like when you're standing on a mountain and you're measuring everything, you get a sense that you see the totality, but you don't. Um, you get a kind of a ersatz wholeness. It's only true from what you can see. So you're just sort of cutting out a piece of the whole and mistaking that for the ground the fundamental, the universal. And he says, you know, we needed that for measurement in science, et cetera. Um, I actually think that the postmodern turn, since it's aware of that, is actually kind of reclaiming some insight in modernity in, in sort of the mental project. But, you know, the, the, the social phenomenon right now where everyone is in this culture war, um, I think it, it is, again, more of the sort of ailment of being between these worlds where we want to network and we want to have this more social orientation, um, the, the ignored and the repressed and the kind of the power dynamics of the whole process of this sort of perspectival um, uh, egoification and domination because the perspectival world has this sort of, from the beginning, this spatializing, colonializing impulse, you know, to kind of go off and conquer space. The mental means wrath mental menace means wrath. So this is kind of going forth, spatializing as a subject, conquering and opposing an object or assimilating it. You know, um, it started off, that, that is what the mental is. So I think this kind of deconstruction of that is, is healthy. It's a little immoderate at the same time. You know, we're kind of seeing a, an extreme form of it in the deconstruction, but it's just kind of part of the process. I think we're probably going to get out of that <laughs> sooner than later. Um, so that's sort of my initial thoughts, this sort of like postmodern turn after, after the war was this kind of reclaiming of self-insight in terms of the perspectival world kind of getting to know what it's doing and um, uh, being more cautious about continuing the mental project. But it's not necessarily answering the integral impulse, which is a sort of seeing the whole again we need a new form of seeing the whole. And I think that's where the integral comes in, where um, instead of spatializing and creating these false totalities, we're beginning to explore these new stylisms that I've been talking about with diaphony and simultaneity and electronic culture, and et cetera. But that, it's all kind of amorphous right now. So it makes sense why we're kind of still in the middle of the, of, of the collapse of the perspectival world in a, in a culture war again, right? total fragmentation. It's dead on perspectival. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is, this is another one where I, I kind of wanted to get your opinion and see, see if I'm just kind of reality test my uh, perception, but I know I've, I kind of went back and, and read some of, or tried to read, I should, I should say some of the Foucault and Derrida's original works. Just, just not even sometimes when I read philosophy, it's not 
only to you know really understand the content, but just to kind of feel into the spirit of it. Like, like mm-hmm. what are they really getting at? How does this really feel? And this is kind of my takeaway, and I kind of wanted to run it by you. I don't know how, how extensively you study like Derrida or Foucault specifically, but to me, part of the spirit of postmodernism which I think is not fully articulated, at least to the degree that I would want it to be, is kind of the spirit of making the invisible visible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jordan Peterson is constantly going off on how, you know, these guys were Marxists, these guys were Marxists. And I think that's true a little bit, but I think what's also kind of missing is um, that I think it was very much based off of, you know, Paul Ricoeur's three masters of suspicion, of Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud. And, and how these guys were suspicious, they were kind of cynical of people's motives because there's a lot more that just meets the eye, right? People are not always rational. They're driven by, as I like to break it down, to sex, money, and power. Mm-hmm. And how what Derrida was trying to get to in writing and, 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 and lang- studying language was how this idea of deconstruction is trying to understand that every word, every sentence that we ascribe meaning to actually has a lot of layers to it, a lot of mm-hmm. invisible layers that he called the trace, right? And that you want to try to excavate these layers and see how every, every word and every meaning actually derives its meaning through difference, through contrast from other words that are not present in the sentence. It derives its identity from the network that surrounds it of infinitely expanding chain of signification, as he called it, these sliding signifiers. And it kind of gets very like kind of creepy, like kind of weird, like really quickly with all, you know, cause it's just so like, it feels like I'm trapped in like a, like a maze that never ends of infinite signs proliferating. And Foucault too was kind of getting at what we, what we take at first glance of knowledge. There are actually all of these invisible power structures and societal dynamics that went into creating that, right? And the example I always give is if Monsanto says that, releases a study that says pesticides are harmless, I'm going to be skeptical because I know of all of the money and power and corruption and lobbying and so forth that went into that objective knowledge. So there's, there's more to the story than what initially meets the eye that wasn't necessarily explicated or explored by the rational, you know, purely mental philosophers or sociologists. And so this kind of attitude of skepticism that there are all of these invisible structures that are at play and they want to make those visible. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did it in a very healthy, like very reasonable way, but I think that that's kind of the spirit of it is it is kind of Freudian, you know, it is kind of like Mm -hmm. taking a Freudian lens to, you know, Jacques Lacan, like, the lang- like the un- uh, what do you say language the unconscious is structured like a language and I would even say that you know like language to Derrida is structured like the unconscious in a way like do you, yeah am I making any sense here or? totally yeah that's that's sort of what I was getting at with the whole idea that uh, the postmodern turn is is really trying to bring back and retrieve the function of the mental which originally was insight into the psyche it was originally um, you know Gebser has this phrase in Ever Present Origin um, that um, it's a dialogue. I don't know if it's from the Bible. I forget exactly what the, the, the quote is, but it's, it's, it's a Christian context story where somebody's talking about this dream of a partridge that they had and the philosopher responds, well, you know, the, the partridge is an image of your soul. And it's this idea that making the cut initially gives you insight into the psyche, it gives you, it liberates you from just being kind of compelled by the psychistic realms of the unperspectable and the mythical. Um, it's supposed to generate self-knowledge. And if you take it out of that context and you kind of drift forward into history, the modernist project kind of started with this um, elation of expanding itself into space, but it wasn't really able to think about um, how it was constructing those meanings. And the, the descriptions you're describing, the sort of invisible syntax in which we've been generating the world. And, and the, the crisis of the 20th century um, woke us up to like, whoa, 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 we need to like look at what we're doing and understand what's invisible about the whole modernist project. So it's taking the mental again and retrieving it and looking back in a necessary way. And I think you're totally right that that, the idea of the rendering the invisible visible is actually also the the process of uh, the integral structure in that um, these decades and centuries of this sort of expansionist um, uh, uh, hypertrophy of the ego and of spatialization that we see with modernity. There's a lot of like power and advancement, et cetera, but there's also a lot of ignorance as to what's going on behind the eyes and in these sort of invisible structures of power and et cetera. So um, to me, like it's, it's a, it was a necessary project to be able to have to do that. And Gebser himself, we can kind of see him 
and I write about this sometimes as a post-war thinker as well, he also was responding to the crisis of modernity and the collapse uh, after World War II uh, of meaning. But of course, Gebser had a more spiritual orientation and, and this sort of, he wasn't just seeing the response to be what the postmodernists did, which was, let's just use the mental. We're not, this is not a, a different project from modernity. We're just being, uh, we're using the tools of modernity back on modernity itself and gaining knowledge about what we're, we've actually been doing. Gebser's kind of going, yeah, okay, but this is still a structure of consciousness. And to really be able to answer the crisis and to respond to the crisis, we need the kind of the integral understanding, um, which is why I think, you know, Gebser's approach and, and a lot of integral thinkers, um, they, they're helping us kind of get to the underlying structure of consciousness that's producing the whole world that we're living in, right? The mental structure can kind of speak to both modernity and post-modernity perspective of the world. Um, so that's why I find it so useful and helpful. Like, I don't know if you've read Mark Fisher's work. He's kind of one of these postmodern neo Marxists, as, as Peterson described. But, um, you know, th this idea into understanding capital and economic ideology, like, how could we not look at that, you know, to, to turn a blind eye to that or to react against it because of the immoderation of postmodernity would be to willingly kind of, it's kind of an escape. It's kind of a flight back to things. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the intellectual dark web, there, there's some things that they're doing that are, that are helpful um, in the sense that they're responding to um, the way cultural fragmentation has been continuing to get worse and worse. Right. So they want to have these long form conversations and enter debate and, and that's certainly, and, and resurrect the soul with like Peterson and talk about meaning and depth and, but like, you know, without the postmodern insight about, you know, well, capitalism and late capitalism is part of why you feel desold, you know, that there's economic and ideological projects that have been going on for the past few hundred years that have resulted in this phenomenon. So that, there's cultural fragmentation and desoulment, et cetera. Postmodernists have insight into that. They don't have necessarily insight into the more the non-secular as much, of course, that, you know, um, but they still have an important insight that I think is, it would, be, it would be remiss to, to ignore, you know, um, and I mentioned Mark Fisher because of, of, this is an example of how I think Gebser's insight can help us. Um, Mark Fisher describes this kind of freezing of time, right? But, but, but he's kind of talking about it in terms of the project of modernity, kind of going into the future and creating this better utopian socialist world, right? Very modernist project as well, actually. Um, that kind of got canceled and sort of devoured by Francis Fukuyama's sort of end of history, mm -hmm. or he calls it capitalist realism, as this sort of... Um, nightmarish capacity of capitalism to turn everything into a means of, uh, of, of capital, to make them turn everything into a profit, to revert everything back into itself, even its own revolutions that try to destroy it. It, it, it products, it turns that into a product, it markets it. Um, uh, you know, I've heard the example before of like uh, Philip K. Dick's book, uh, or st short story, we can remember it for you wholesale, where like somebody's trying to be a revolutionary, but it's all a simulation within the same system. So capitalist realism is a great insight, actually. It's the same, if you trace it back, it's talking about this sort of, uh, what, Der uh, not Derrida, but um, Deleuze and Guattari talked about with capitalism as this monstrous thing that other cultures knew to keep at bay because it can devour everything and assimilate everything. To me, this is talking about the perspectival in its sort of unhealthy form. It's, it's the all-measuring, all-consuming um, uh, capacity to just inflate and control and measure. And there's that impulse that we've seen in capitalism that has sort of ramped us up to this crisis. This is a perspectival crisis. So I can see, anyway, with my own application of Gebser, that it's speaking to the spiritual, it's speaking to the postmodernist, it's speaking to the modernist. So there's a kind of a translation capacity in mm -hmm. Gebser's work that I found to be very useful. Um, anyway, I'm rambling now, but. <laughs> no, yeah, that was, that was awesome. It made me think of a lot about also crit the critical theorists. And you, in your book, you had mentioned Heidegger and his concept of like in framing. And I'm mm -hmm. also thinking about uh, Herbert Marcuse, like one dimensional man and, and all these other critical theorists who are saying things are very similar to what you're saying. Um, so I guess my last question to you for today is moving forward, 
you know, we, we've, we've done a thorough job of kind of analyzing some of the, the shortcomings and some of the problems uh, of society these days, you know, mentioned, you know, climate change and, you know, capitalism and all these other commensurate problems. I'm just curious, kind of what is Jeremy's uh, vision for moving us forward into the integral age or Jeremy's plan to save the world? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's bigger than any one of us, but also it's not, you know, I think, um, the, the the spiritual insight that folks like Gebser or even Aurobindo and Tehard were trying to point out, or even McLuhan, is um, the to the degree that we can be integral ourselves and and concretize all of these structures to to bring them to retract them back into us and render them conscious, including the mental. If we could, this whole world we've been talking about and all of its problems and how it's kind of fundamentally the sort of underlying phenomenological mutation that's outrun itself if we can really grasp that and understand it very clearly um and then also understand how the other structures kind of unhealthily play out in that process right like even um we we're talking about cultural fragmentation where everybody has their own little point that's sort of retrieving the the deficient magical as well and you know you're in this sort of totalizing identification, collapsing the ego into this one-dimensional. I stand for this against this person, and there's a kind of a non-conscious doing without consciousness in an unhealthy way that retrieves the magical. Um, you know, the mental kind of becomes a plaything of these forces when it's not conscious. So, to the degree that we can become integral and 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 be conscious of all these dimensions that are in us that are playing out in the world and creating these crises in the world. Um, then we can begin to enact a different world. And I, I think it's super important to do this personally and individually, right? To, to James Joyce has this example, and I always use this because it's such a beautiful description. Uh, McLuhan ha riffs on James Joyce and Gutenberg Galaxy. Um, and, and McLuhan describes his approach as applied Joyceanism. So that's how highly he thought of, of Joyce. Mm. Um, but but he, he interprets um, Finnegan's Wake as this, uh, um, integration of all of the different, in McLuhan's words, you know, the different media forms, the different technologies of human beings that have played out in the world, the sacral pre-literate, pre the literate culture, the kind of electronic post postmodern culture that was just coming online at the time. And somehow this individual is able to kind of internalize all of them and like a kaleidoscope is able to bring them forward as they're needed and to be present. And, and everything simultaneous to kind of have a, have a kaleidoscope of, of, of the structures of consciousness kind of present within the self. Um, I think it's so important just to enact presence and to be able to do that. And perhaps the future human being, um, you know, they will be able to bring forth the magic and the mythic and the mental where it's necessary, but not, not any one of them will take over immoderately, that somehow this age requires the whole being and that these different dimensionalities can unfold and then retract as needed. Um, you know, William Irwin Thompson has this, this image in an old 1970s book I called for, uh, Darkness and Scattered Light, Four Talks About the Future. And one of them is this beautiful image of sort of seeing us at the end and at the beginning, like, like the archaic human being, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, for Gebser, the archaic, everything was latent in the self. All of the structures that would unfold are sort of, hidden in us in, in a kind of a latent form. Um, and so we were a kind of a dormant integrality in the archaic. Um, I think that's our future, but it's going to be an activated and super conscious where everything will be retracted in and will be super hype, hyper wakeful about all of those structures. So Thompson describes the future human being as this kind of nomadic hunter gatherer that has internalized the whole story of civilization and separation and industrialization in themselves. And they can bring out the city when they need to, and they can be the hunter gatherer when they need to. There are like domains and worlds within themselves that have become virtualized. And so you carry your city in your heart and like you can project it. a very sci-fi image of sort of um, almost like a fairy city that just sort of opens up in a new dimension. You can step in it. Um, I think, you know, whether or not that's literally going to be true, the future human will be a lot more like the original human being in, in the upper Paleolithic, where 
um, as David Graeber describes, we were playing with all of these different structures. Um, we were playing with hierarchy. We were playing with decentralization. It was a sort of fluidic and dynamic movement of all of these different forms of, of, of cultural organization and being in the world. Um, secularity will have a space. The magic, the mythic, the mental will all have spaces. So whatever that looks like, I hope we can achieve it um, because I think that will help us sort of um, restore balance. And, and I, I want to bring up one more quote from Le Guin, just paraphrasing her in, uh, in a beautiful little book that I recommend everybody read. It's a very integral kind of book um, implicitly called The, the, the Lathe of Heaven. And um, in it, it, it's a very philosophical book, but they're having a, they have a lot of debates. So it's these two characters that are always kind of talking about it. One is very embodying the sort of modernist project of like doing good work and, and altering the world in the sort of um, trajectory of modernity. And the other guy is, is kind of this um, self-described Taoist who's like, no, mm -hmm. we shouldn't. But his argument though is, you know, civilization makes us um, conscious, but not conscious enough. And this sort of ability to manipulate the world what we need to do is to be even more conscious and so restore ourselves in balance to the whole. Other beings just do it. They're all just sort of embedded. They're all latent. Human beings are in this kind of weird intermediary place where we have to consciously integrate the whole. And I think that's the integral structure, the consciously integrate the whole. We've kind of been in this sort of in-between state for a while. Um, so that's my vision, just to somehow consciously integrate the whole and to bring everything we've been doing and miniaturize it into the self and hopefully restore a little bit more balance with the world in terms of all the crises that we've been seeing. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, uh, Jeremy, thank you so much. This has been so inspiring and enlightening and illuminating for me. Um, and just lastly, um, can you share a little bit about kind of the work you're doing or your website or classes or that stuff? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Ryan. This has been really wonderful. And I really enjoyed your comments and, and insights as well. They've, it's good to be interacting with a, a like mind and, and kind of riffing on these topics. It's really fun. Um, but yeah, people can find my work at my homepage, jeremydanieljohnson.com. Um, I have a Patreon. We have a little book club. The Lake of Heaven is one of the books we read recently. Uh, we're currently doing PKD's Valis, um, Philip K. Dick. And uh, they can also find me on revelor.press, which is where uh, my book was published through, but we're going to be doing some other kind of integral oriented projects coming up and publications. Um, and, and neural learning, which is where I'm hosting other individuals classes, but it's sort of an integral oriented uh, learning school, online school. Um, so I'm, right now I'm actually hosting um, a read through of ever present origin. So we've got a, a nice graduate size level class and everybody is, in, is, is doing the marathon of reading through Everpresent Origin with me and, and there's mm. um, pre-recorded lectures and, and uh, live Q&A sessions and it's been really engaging. So um, if folks are interested in that, they can certainly uh, join me there. So, Awesome, awesome. And, and you can send me these things, you know, I'll post the links um, on the YouTube channel. But uh, yeah, again, thank you so much and uh, I really look forward to uh, talking to you again. Likewise, likewise, Ryan. Thank you. All right, take care.